Orthodoxy is a type of Christianity which places a lot of value in tradition and the oneness of the church. Today, an Orthodox Christian from the channel, Kyle, will come on to talk about Orthodox Christianity and further explain his views. Could you explain the basics of Orthodox Christianity and what makes it unique? On the most basic level, Orthodox Christianity is the oldest church in the world, founded by Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, the Messiah that we read about in the Old Testament that the Jews were looking to, to be the liberator. The Messiah would bless all the nations, and that is Jesus. And he is followers, the apostles, basically the church, the Orthodox Church was founded in 33 AD, the fulfillment of the promise of, of Abraham, that Abraham's seed would bless all nations. And Jesus is a descendant of Abraham and all these great figures that we read about uh, in the Old Testament of the Davidic lineage. And Jesus and the apostles bring salvation to the entire world. And they do this through spreading the gospel the church and so that's what the orthodox church is is that we're the continuation of that church that was founded at pentecost and we like to define orthodoxy in contrast of other forms of christianity that we see in the west this is useful since um, you know i'm of a western background and that's what a lot of people are familiar with is primarily catholicism and protestantism both of these are things that originated long after Jesus and the Apostles in the first with the Great Schism in 1054. That's when the Roman Catholic Church split from the Orthodox Church because of their claims of papal supremacy and adding to the Nicene Creed the Filioque, which is a heretical addition to the Creed. And basically the Catholic Church kept innovating and innovating, and this caused the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther in Europe in the 1500s. And this Christianity, Protestantism, has spread to America. And that's what a lot of people are familiar with, either Protestantism or Catholicism. But a lot of people don't know about Orthodoxy. And Orthodoxy, we could say, is just original Christianity in its pre-medieval form. When we say Orthodox, some people may confuse that with Judaism, like, oh, are you Jewish? But Orthodox just means right belief. It doesn't mean uh, rabbinical Jew or Orthodox Jew. Uh, we also say that we are the Catholic Church, but that doesn't mean Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic Church is is what happened in the Great Schism. Uh, we are the Eastern Orthodox Church, and Catholic means whole, universal, that the wholeness of the faith is at the local church. And this is what we read about from the early saints, like Ignatius of Antioch in the first few centuries of the church, said where the bishop is, is, is the church. And the bishop is just a successor of the apostle. So like I talked about earlier, the apostles at Pentecost, they had the Holy Spirit come upon them, and the Holy Spirit gave them the, the ability to speak in all different languages, and that's how they were able to go all throughout the world. All, you know, Thomas even went to India, and, the, and you know, Peter and Paul went, went to Rome. They went all throughout the, the empire and the world to spread the gospel. And this promise at Pentecost is the Holy Spirit would always guide the church. And Jesus gave the apostles a special authority, the binding and loosing powers, and each apostle had their own successors, and that's what we call apostolic secession because some groups would arise like the Gnostics that would start teaching uh, new doctrines that were uh, not taught by Jesus. And they claim, oh, well, you know, we believe in Jesus, just not in the way that you do. But they had no succession, no laying on the hands back to the apostles. So that's very important. And as Orthodox Christians, we don't believe that we're just another denomination. We believe we're pre-denominational since you know, Catholicism and Protestantism, those arose so long after uh, the, the history of the church, since the church was founded. Uh, some important doctrines are the Trinity. We believe in the triune God, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some people will claim that this doctrine was invented at the First Council of Nicaea, but we can read earlier people in church history, the church fathers, apostolic fathers, and see that they all taught the Trinity, that God is one essence, three persons. And that may confuse a lot of people but that's what has been revealed to us. We, we see in the, in the Trinity that God inter interacts with the world. We see this in Genesis that God says that let us make man in our image, our, our likeness. And this is very important in Orthodox theology and Christian theology, that humans are made in the image of God. And we have lost that likeness since original sin, which started you know, when the first humans cr were created, Adam and Eve. We, God gave one command, you know, commandment is just don't eat of that tree. 
and the first humans did that and that caused that caused sin death destruction to enter the world so the whole point of jesus and the messiah is jesus is supposed to be the the new adam since adam was the first person and mary his mother is the new eve that now there's this uh you know god himself becoming incarnate dying on the cross and reconciling the the basically the human and divine uh you know a divine person the, the the son assuming a human nature to die for our sins and so that's ultimately what we have faith in is jesus christ in his church some things that differentiates orthodoxy that maybe some people aren't familiar with is that we put a huge emphasis on icon iconography since this is very important about the the incarnational principle and and de deifying matter that if you know jesus is the the icon of the father and that we are able to have these windows into heaven through through the icons um, and if we're not worshiping we're just venerating uh the person depicted in the picture since it's not about the piece of wood it's about the person that is being depicted and so that's why we show we have lots of icons in our church and we venerate the icons uh, prayer is very important. We also do fasting, which means lots of different things. It could be fasting from certain food, fasting from certain activities. This helps us to build willpower and to and to grow closer to God and not not be too dependent on the world. It's not that the world is evil. The world is actually very good. The creation is good. It's all about the right order of using what God has given us because everything that God has made is good. It's just how, how we're using that. Alms giving is also very important, uh, helping helping the poor, helping those that are that are less fortunate, and we worship God every Sunday in the divine liturgy. L liturgy means just ordered worship, and our ordered worship goes back to the Old Testament and what Moses had revealed to him. We still have a lot of those archetypes, you know, the priesthood, the sacrifice. We have the we have the Eucharist in our divine liturgy, and I think that. When people go to the Divine Liturgy for the first time, they're really amazed and stunned by the beauty of it, by the incense, by the amazing chants that we don't see in Protestantism. We don't see in Catholicism, especially since the 1960s when they've severely changed how they worship God uh, with the Novus Ordo. Um, but there is some more traditional Catholic worship ceremonies. They, they have the Eastern Catholics and traditional Latin Mass, but the Pope's going to be getting rid, rid of the Latin Mass uh, pretty soon. Uh, it's, it's been made obvious that he's going to do that. So that's why I always tell people to just go to their local divine liturgy and experience orthodoxy since it's something that is that is lived out. And within the church, we receive the sacrament, which God gave us. Uh, we have seven sacraments or mysteries, uh, the first one being baptism, chrismation, the Eucharist, holy orders, which is like being ordained to the priesthood or monasticism, and then marriage, and then anointing the sick and, and death. Um, so basically all these sacraments revolve around the life inside the church. We baptize and chrismate our infants and infants can receive the Eucharist in our church. So basically all of these are, you know, our ability to interact with, with God's grace through a process called theosis where we're able to become you know more christ-like and restore that likeness that's what uh, orthodox christianity is about is restoring this broken relationship between god and man and we do believe in the bible we have the holy scripture which is a part of tradition uh, our bible for those who don't know what the bible is it's the old testament and new testament the old testament is from ancient judaism because orthodox christianity is just the continuation the fulfillment of ancient Judaism. Many people confuse modern Jews, which were rabbinical Jews, which are actually, wait, don't really even follow the Torah. They follow really the Talmud. They think it kind of supersedes the Torah. So a lot of people get confused on that. But basically, the Old Testament has lots of, lots of books. That's a majority of the Bible. And then the New Testament is just the life of Jesus. And we have the full, full uh, Deuterocanon. That's kind of another dispute between the Protestants is uh, Martin Luther based his Old Testament canon based on the Masoretic text. Orthodox always use the Septuagint, which has uh, more books in the Old Testament. And so Martin Luther and a lot of Protestants have books removed from their Bible. And they also have like false beliefs that uh, we just need the Bible, Bible alone. But we don't paint this dialectic between like Bible and tradition because for Orthodox, tradition is made up of multiple things, including the Holy Scripture, uh, including the ecumenical councils, including the writings and lives of the saints. 
all of these things make up the uh, what is infallible and what is, what is guided by the Holy Spirit. A lot of Protestants and naturalists would take issue with tradition being inherently valuable, as opposed to a guide. Why is it such a vital part of your faith? Yeah, I think that everything has a tradition, no matter what ideology you're in. Even something like Protestantism, there are more traditional Protestants, like there's traditional high church Anglicans, traditional high church Lutherans, a traditional Calvinist, and it's kind of like there's a clearly defined Orthodox, little Orthodox, meaning just right belief. Um, like a Calvinist, are some of them are going to very specifically ascribe to the teachings of, of Calvin and the Westminster Confession and all of these things. And then there's other Calvinists that aren't as traditional where they follow other things or make, make different focuses. But the point is, is that especially in Christianity, you're a lot of your theology is inherited. It's it's given to us. But when I talked about Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming up on the apostles, it's that the Holy Spirit is is the fire that is you know guiding the church in every age. We're we're just keeping this fire lit. That is, that is our job. It's just it's passed from one generation to another, and we don't want to blow out the fire. We don't want to radically transform anything with the fire. Our job is just to keep the fire going. And for someone who isn't as religious, who's maybe a naturalist, materialist, skeptic, whatever ideology, those also have traditions. There's a skeptical tradition. You can read someone like David Hume and see the arguments that he brought up. And skepticism, uh, you could say, even existed before. There's roots of this all, all throughout uh, human civilization. So someone who just views it as a guide is, and, and it doesn't put as high of an importance at, on tradition is going to repeat a lot of mistakes that have already been worked out. For example, in orthodoxy, there's all these ancient heresies. Um, like, you know, in Christianity, there's ecclesiology, which is a study of the church, sacramentology, the study of the sacraments, Christology, study of, uh, of, of, of Jesus and how, you know, the theology of Christ. There's Trinitarian theology. And Certain disputes arose through Christian history. And the problem with these like Protestant groups that are going by like Bible alone is they end up just reinventing the wheel. Like they're just reinventing ancient heresies. And I think that concept exists not only in Christianity, but any ideology is that if you're just not putting this emphasis on tradition, you're probably just going to reinvent the wheel and create problems that have already been solved. And so the best thing to do is to look at tradition, see what they got right, you know, see, see what they got wrong. Um, you know, Christianity is a little bit different since we believe, you know, the Holy Spirit guides the church. But whatever sphere you're in, it's, history is important. That way you're, you're, you're not just going in a circle. Atheists and Catholics often criticize orthodoxy for being more focused on so-called mysticism or a personal connection with the divine as opposed to more scholastic, naturalistic, or philosophical means of investigation. How would you characterize and respond to that? So I would characterize that opinion as not entirely true because we're not opposed to being scholastic, to being philosophical, to naturalistic investigation. All those things are fine and they're actually good in their proper place. And that's what orthodoxy is about. It's about having all these things in their correct place, in the right order. Like, you don't want to turn these into an idol, having scholasticism, which arises in the West after the Great Schism, just focusing on philosophy, just focusing on naturalistic investigation. We can see that in the way that the West went, especially with someone like Thomas Aquinas, they get away from, you know, having the right order of theology of starting with like Trinitarian theology and revelation and starting with philosophical speculation about, you know, kind of arguments for God that are autonomous from revelation. And we can see how it kind of devolves over time in the West that you get people like Descartes with a cogito. It's like, oh, I can show that God exists without Christianity. And then the more and more they get away from Revelation, they get away from Christianity, and they start going into deism. It keeps degrading more and more. It's like, well, actually, we don't even really need this watchmaker God to justify our system. It leads to atheism when you don't have things in the right order, when you start to be... Uh, start to turn scholasticism into an idol. Philosophy ultimately doesn't save us. It's useful to describe things in theology, and that's how the church fathers used it, is they used it to argue, you know, against these different groups, to describe exactly what they meant about the Trinity. 
all of these are are very very important and naturalistic investigation i mean the church and christianity is what furthered science the most so there's not a dialectical opposition between science and christianity it's just when things get out of order and you start putting science on this idol you turn into it starts to evolve into scientism and that causes a lot of problems and my patron saint gregory palamas really highlighted this in this book called the triads where he argues against the west and a lot of their presuppositions in, in this person called the uh, barlium that basically if the west goes down this route you know they're going to have an unknowable god um, it kind of goes into their theology of absolute divine simplicity versus orthodox. We believe in, you know, the essence energies distinction. And it's like, what are we experiencing in God? Are they just created effects? Or are we actually experiencing the uncreated? So I think that I would characterize that opinion as not entirely true since we're not opposed to them. And I would respond to saying all those are good. Just have them in the right order. Epistemically speaking, why do you place the experience of God before investigation? Because investigation ultimately rests on presuppositions about the world that can't be justified just using sense data. This is called in epistemology, there's classical foundationalism versus a type of coherentism. And classical foundationalism, which is a lot of what Western philosophy turned into, tries to just say, well, I can believe this because of this. And then they just try and kind of stack these things that they think they can, th they can know through sense data. But they don't realize that there's all these presuppositions that they have coming to that sense data. And so the argument would be if you don't start with revelation, then you're going to, you can't really justify anything because it's not just building, I know this, I know this, I know this, therefore I can have a coherent worldview. It's kind of like you need to assume all those at the same time because they depend on each other in order to have a uh, coherent worldview um, is, is, is what I would say is the problem with that line of thinking and justification. And that's why presuppositionalism is like really the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you don't start with that, if you don't start with revelation, then ultimately it's hard to justify anything in the, in the world. Like if you're ex experiencing something, you have no way to know if it's uh, an illusion or not. And if everything, if you can't be certain about that, then it just leads you to not ever being able to actually have justified true belief and any real knowledge would be impossible. What does this mean for scientific discoveries like evolution and the age of the universe? You know, everyone has a worldview. And when a, when a scientist says, oh, we discovered this, it means that they have like a system where things seem to make sense. They can make these predictions and it seems to make sense. And science is constantly being updated and changed because the scientific method isn't about getting you absolute truth. It's like, okay, this is kind of like reliable. We've done this. This this seems to make sense. Then it'll become, you know, a theory and, and generally accepted and things like that. But the thing is, is that ultimately you have to argue at the paradigm level because we all have assumptions. The scientific, scientists have assumptions when they're going and doing the scientific method, that's relying on not physical assumptions, but, but metaphysical assumptions uh, like, you know, induction, that the future is going to be like the past. But how do you justify that on a worldview where everything is random? If everything is random, then the laws of physics are random and evolving too. Are they not? Are they even real is another question because a lot of the scientists don't even know about the philosophy of science and defining what is real versus anti-real. If, if logic is just a, a social construct and we destroyed all humans, then would logic still exist? So that's what's really important is a lot of scientists don't actually take any philosophy of science courses and they don't realize that they have all these metaphysical presuppositions that are required to get them to these claims that they're making about, you know, macroevolution, which is more of a philosophy, and the age of the earth. For example, when we're talking about the age of the earth, there's lots of different dating methods that we can, they can use to come to these different numbers. Uh, to date the universe, they will say that you can see things that are so far away and we, we know that the speed of light is this, and that's that far away. Therefore, the universe has to be this amount of years old, which is they've ranged in the billions. But this is all assuming that that, that has always 
acted in that way, which is just an assumption. It could have remained the same. It could have changed. You can never really know on their worldview. It's just an assumption. And they have lots of factors where there is a changing universe, like going from, you know, the Big Bang. Um, and, and, the, and you'll see that in other dating methods, they'll apply like arbitrary changes in order to justify it. And especially on the, the astronomy front, the, uh, I think the James Webb Telescope has discovered universes and things that are older than the Big Bang, and it kind of is contradicting their, all, all their models. And that, that's what we have to remember. It's all, of, you know, when they say scientists have discovered something, it's just they have a model that they think works well and can make predictions. And when, when it doesn't make the, the right predictions, they kind of just reinterpret the data. It's ultimately what we all do, and that's why we really need to argue at the paradigm level, um, which the, most scientists don't even know about. They're just arguing like kind of these these facts, like, oh, I dated this bone, and it says it's this this many years this many years old. But it's like, do you know that it actually is with a hundred percent certainty that it is that old, that old? Um, you know, for example, they use something like carbon dating. This is still the same problem of assuming that the rate of carbon decay has always, radioactive carbon decay has always been the same. And if they're going to make these grandiose claims that they can extrapolate data back millions, billions of years, you're going to need something more than, well, it's always been that way, so I'm just going to assume this. Um, so that's why I get back to the, the paradigm level. And can your worldview really answer those paradigm level questions? And I don't think their worldview can. And so for those specific issues, on uh, evolution, and the age of the universe, I think there is a healthy amount of skepticism. Uh, I don't deny that there's, you know, microevolution that, you know, different dog breeds. I mean, we could see all the different dog breeds, but is that the same as saying that like a single cell organism, if you just give it enough time, it's gonna turn into a human. It's not guided by anything. Um, and if that's true, how could we trust our own rationality and reasoning? If, if our own rationality and reasoning is not anything, there's no telos behind it, it's just, about, it's just about what survived, then it doesn't require, it doesn't, we can't know for certain if we evolve for, for truth, for, for ultimate truth. Our brain could have believed, can believe, and we could sense a lot of things that aren't true, but helps us survive. And if that's true, then we can't, ha we can't have faith in these chemicals in our brain. And so I would argue that on their paradigm, uh, knowledge becomes impossible. The laws of logic, the laws of physics, all of those things become random and evolving. If the Orthodox Church is the one true church, what does that mean for other Christian denominations and other religions? Yeah, so the Orthodox Church is the Ark of Salvation. Just like we read about in the time of Noah, you know, there was one Ark. And it's important to remember that Jesus Christ came and he died for every single human being. That is the point of the incarnation. And a doctrine that's often lost in the West is the harrowing of Hades, where basically Jesus comes and he descends into Hades and he preaches the gospel to the dead. Uh, you know, all the prophets and everyone we read about in the Old Testament, all the pagans, he preached the gospel to everyone. So everyone got a fair chance. And so that's important because we have to remember that, that, you know, Jesus loves everyone. But he also left a specific authority on earth, the church, and all the things that we read about in the Bible for salvation happen within the church. Baptism, the Eucharist, uh, repentance, conf confession, all these things, they happen within a life in the church. So I would say if anyone knows about the Orthodox Church, they should become Orthodox. And you're all going to be judged, we're all going to be judged on the light that we were given. You know, we all have the law written on our heart. How are we living to that every single day? So other, other Christian groups, especially if they know about Orthodoxy, uh, we say to give them a, a good uneasiness, that they're, they're not where they should be. Uh, they've got a lot of heretical theology, they aren't worshiping properly, it's, it's leading them astray. And that's not good for them. That's not good for anyone. And we want, that, have, want them to have the fullest relationship with God. And that happens within the church. And then for other religions, there is, you know, they can find things that are true, like asceticism is good, that uh, di different things about the world, they can, they can see that there are some truths um, or, or, or some virtues. Like St. Paul talked about the virtues of, of the Greeks. Like they got, they got things right because there is like an amount of natural revelation. But ultimately, 
their paradigm is lacking the full revelation, Christ. And so it's all about spreading as an Orthodox Christian, I want to spread the gospel uh, to all nations and to, to every person, no matter what religion they are, if they don't have a religion, I think that they will live a happier, fuller uh, life with Christ and have the greatest thing, the eternal kingdom that so many saints have 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 died for because of the the truth of of Jesus. How does this relate to the concept of symphonia or what's described as a harmony between church and state? Do you believe there should be a wall between church and state? Um, not in the way that liberal democracies have it now. Symphonia is about, we don't want to have the church as a state. That's what kind of happened in the West with the Pope. And that leads to a lot of problems and subversion within the church and things start to be more about geopolitics and theology. Christianity wasn't legalized for the first 300 years. And it wasn't until Emperor Constantine came and he legalized Christianity and, he's, and he got all the bishops together and he said, you know, let's have a council and rule on, you know, what we actually uh, believe and we can, we can anathematize the false beliefs that were arising at that time. And we can check the Council of Nicaea with what was taught before. There wasn't a rupture. Constantine didn't paganize the church. But we can see that this character of the emperor working together with the church has defined the history of Christianity and led to very long-standing empires like the Eastern Roman Empire lasted for nearly 1,500 years, the long-lasting empire in human history. And this is how they functioned, is they had the emperor, the head of the state, and they had the church. And together, they both have their function. And we can see this if you ever look up a Byzantine flag. That's what it symbolizes, is those two working together. And so I think that this is something that we've seen throughout the testimony of Christian history, and that it brings a lot of stability because they both should balance out each other. It's often said that the Orthodox Church is currently facing internal division due to the Russo-Ukraine war. The Patriarch of Moscow has declared the war in Ukraine to be a holy war by Russia. What does this mean for the church in your view? Yeah, so all throughout church history, there has been internal divisions over theology, over geopolitics. There's been lots of instances of Christians killing each other, and it's very sad. And that's why we pray for this issue. Uh, Russia and Ukraine, I mean, they're, they're brothers and cousins. They actually, Christianity came through Ukraine, the, the borderlands, to you know the, the Russian Empire. So they have a long history together. And people will bring this up on a superficial level to act like orthodoxy isn't universal because they don't really understand what that means in the context of the church. And they'll say, oh, well, look at the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but basically, the universality in the creed, we say the church is one holy Catholic or universal and apostolic. The universal just means that universally, every orthodox church is going to teach the same faith. And we have that in the orthodox church. Catholic Church doesn't have that, and the Catholic Church is also under geopolitical influence of, of the West. I mean, also, all throughout the history of the Catholic Church, it has been subverted by geopolitical entities. I mean, they moved to Avignon, France, for, for a while. There was the Frankish papacy. The, constantly, politics and religion are intertwined, and there's this battle. And so... The Patriarch of Moscow, he called it a holy war because sadly Ukraine is kind of giving in to Western influences. They have a non-Christian leader. Uh, NATO was kind of founded just to combat Russia. I mean, Russia, Russia tried to join NATO. They wouldn't let him join it. And so Russia is feeling, is feeling threatened because there's this ever encroaching entity that's getting bigger and bigger that was founded just to combat them. And they're trying to get Ukraine too. And so uh, Putin made a preemptive strike. I mean, it's more complex than that. And I'm not justifying what he did. Geopolitics is not black and white. People just want a black and white world. But he called it, basically, the Patriarch of Moscow called it a holy war because of these social cultural issues that's happening in Ukraine as they're becoming more Western and less uh, less orthodox, less, less, less Christian, less you know, less, like, more away from Russia. Uh, they legalized porn and weed, and they're having pride parades now. And they also have a, a fake church that was founded by, basically, geopolitical entities within Ukraine and with the, the patriarch of Constantinople. And they're, they're trying to basically 
they, the West sees that the Orthodox churches um, are a are a stumbling block to controlling these countries. So they want to subvert the Orthodox Church in these countries to further just have absolute domination over the country. And so that's basically the Holy War. And as you know, I go to a Serbian church and we have Russians, Romanians, Ukrainians, and we all pray that you know this stops and you know we don't want any more uh, Christians killing each other. But there's a very complex issue. There's a great video lecture on this called Why is the Ukraine Why is Ukraine the West Fault? And this video was made 10 years ago, and I think it really lays out the geopolitical issues um, of this. But basically to summarize, you know, this has happened lots of times throughout church history. It's a fallen world. People are going to are, to, are going to going to fight each other. But ultimately, on a theological level, the Orthodox Church is united. We have the same theology in every church. This gets into the often observed connection between orthodoxy and right-wing politics. Can you explain that connection and whether or not it's necessary to be right-wing to be orthodox? Yeah, so I think that the the trend with, you know, a lot of orthodox people being right-wing is not that we're just so right-wing. It's just that we live in such a left-wing world where liberal democracy is just the normal and liberal leftist values are just very, they're the normative uh, ideology in the West. And so when people see orthodoxy, they see something that is like super traditional and right wing, but it, it really isn't. It's just, we live in a, we live in a revolution. We live in a, in a radical, uh, age since the, um, you know, since the fall and since the great schism and enlightenment, like we just gone farther and farther away from, um, from, from, from truth and basing things on what they should be. Um, based on and ultimately Christianity and orthodoxy is about the eternal kingdom is it, it isn't about about just establishing a right-wing empire it's about repenting and having your faith in Jesus Christ and a lot of orthodox beliefs you you, you can't be like liberal on abortion or LGBT or transgenderism and, and these things we love those people we pray for them that's what we're called to do as Christians but if you're in support of those, then you are a heretic. You're going against the teachings of the Bible, the teachings of the church. So it's, it's not that right-wing politics are necessary because Christianity is really about something so much more and it transcends politics. But a lot of social beliefs of Christians about like getting married and having a family are very contrary to the modern world and they're considered right wing, but really they're just common sense. They're Christian. Um, and they aren't right wing politics aren't necessary for conversion to orthodoxy. You can't reject the teachings of the church, but it's not like you need to be um, super right wing. Um, anyone who is interested in orthodoxy can go visit an orthodox church. It's about getting your life together, praying to God, not putting your hope in politics or world u utopia, but really just focusing on Jesus, going to liturgy, and trusting fully in God. On a more fundamental level, why do you believe in God and his manifestation in Jesus? Why should others believe? Yeah, so I think throughout this, I've talked about kind of, you know, presuppositional arguments, tag the transcendental argument for God. So at a fundamental level to believe in God, you have to go at the paradigm level, worldview. You want to have a worldview that you have justified true belief where you can, uh, like things like logic, including in induction, inductive reasoning, and does your worldview make sense and account for everything that you are claiming? Like a lot of people will claim like, oh, certain things are immoral. But it's like, what what is immoral? How do you know that? How do you have a justified true belief that what you're saying is immoral actually is immoral? And so that goes back to what is the foundation of your belief? And ultimately, if you don't have God as the foundation of your belief, then you can't really with certainty, you know, make knowledge claims. It leads to epistemic nihilism, epistemic error theory. You, you, you can't have a solid epistemology. And a lot of people are also convinced of, of Christianity and God because 
you know, it leads kind of to moral nihilism and just nihilism in general without God. It's like nothing really matters on if, if, if there's no God. I mean, what's the point of waking up every day? The sun's going to, you know, burn out. The universe, is, it's everything's going to come to an end. So it's like, it, it, how do you get morality from that? You can't. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, the moral arguments for God convinces uh, a lot of people because a lot of atheists will claim all make all these moral claims but they can't actually justify them because it's just based on their kind of arbitrary taste preference or presupposition but specifically christianity you know the transcendental argument for god i think it's articulated well by jay dyer as he talks about how the orthodox christian worldview is is the worldview that you need to have to, in order to have justified true belief and there's lots of little details we can go in throughout that that Another thing is the the messianic prophecies. There's you know 351 of them in the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be, uh, who who is you know Jesus, and there's very specific descriptions that are written hundreds of years, thousands of years before Jesus even comes. Like the Second Temple being destroyed, that was destroyed in 70 A.D. after the the Jews revolted and uh, the Romans destroyed the temple, and there's there's prophecies about the Messiah coming before the destruction of the second temple, being able to walk in it. So if the Jews Messiah was going to come, he had to already have come. Um, and there's also a lot of things that don't really make any sense in ancient Judaism, unless Christianity is a fulfillment of it. In Genesis, we see that Abraham is promised that his seed will bless all the nations. In Isaiah, we talk; it talks about how the Messiah is going to be a light to the Gentiles, to the whole world. In, Ma in the book of Malachi, it says, For the rising of the sun, even if it's going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and every place incense shall be offered to my name. So basically, this is in the Old Testament, and how could this small ethno-religion take over the entire world and have incense offered, uh, because we offer incense in the Orthodox Church? Um, and the Orthodox Church is in nearly every country, and it's slowly growing there. Um, and the Gentiles are just non-Jews. So it just, it, it doesn't make any sense that this small ethno-religion would yeah, take over the world and that all these prophecies would be fulfilled. And, you know, in, in Jesus, I think even most atheists would admit that we see the perfect moral model for us, us to live. And we, we need that. And that's what, you know, Jesus, lead, God leads by example. He became incarnate and, and showed us how to live. Um, and Christianity, you know, some people are convinced by more, more utilitarian arguments. We could just look at the history of Christianity and we can see that it's led to the most developments in science, the development of the universities, development of hospitals and orphanages. It was really foundational to the ancient world and to, to the West and to the East, um, you know, Eastern, Eastern Europe in the, in the Middle East to really propelling it forward. And that's why I think we see uh, the overwhelming majority of scientific innovations were in Christian countries. And another thing that a lot of people are facing with is nihilism. Uh, I talked about that a little bit earlier, but it's like, there's really nothing, um, you, you can make up reasons that you want to live and wake up every day. But ultimately like why does anything you do matter a lot of people have trouble dealing with dealing with that and i would say that that can lead to you know it's kind of like a humbling experience it's like seeing i don't know how to make sense of anything and like not only does atheism lead to that kind of nihilism but also leads to the epistemic nihilism where you can't have justified true belief so it's like logically uh morally uh ontologically every reason it's just there's the atheistic materialist worldviews that we see are just ultimately empty. And so I can bring like logical arguments to an atheist, but that's not going to convince them, especially if they're trying to de debate it. They, they're, they're not, most people aren't coming to it to just like, oh, now you have to radically change your life. You have to stop doing all these sins. You have to wake up early on Sunday. What I think is a starting place for a lot of people is just seeing the good fruits of Christianity. And that's why I tell, you know, Christians are so important to be Christ-like. And an atheist may, you know, they, they may respect, it may start with a respect for Christianity. Like, oh, you know, I don't believe what they believe, but, you know, they're nice people. And then it can slowly start to open more doors that they're, they're open to God. Um, many saints did lots of evil things before they, 
repented and came to Christ. Um, one saint, he was stealing a lot of things. He stole things from Christians, uh, these monks, and they said, you can take it. We'll pray for you. And he was so shocked that they responded in that way that he repented and he became a Christian and he became a saint. Um, and so I think the testimony of, of, of Christians is like reading the lives of the saints can, can help a lot of people. And of course, there's a lot of Christian hypocrites, um, and that can also turn a lot of people away. But I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up to say that it's not always just a purely logical reason of why people uh, start to follow Christianity and then start to believe that, you know, Jesus is God. It may start with people becoming sympathetic to Christianity, going to church, because you see the logical reasons for going to church. We, you know, it's a community center. American society is so isolating. You drive to work, then you drive back, you watch football and, and politics. And you just keep doing that for 40 years and hopefully maybe you can retire or the economy's starting to suck and then you just die. It's kind of, a lot of people feel empty. So it's like having a community center where you can go every Sunday to church and get to know really close people, uh, really good people. I've met my best friends. I've met my wife through the church. And it's not just like, oh, we're in a kayaking club and we're in a, we're, we all have this hobby we, we like. It's like, religion is so much more than just a hobby that's why it's been so foundational for civilization and also the next thing is like just getting people to pray is it was really hard for me coming from an atheistic background just to pray but there's lots of benefits even if you don't believe in god and i think if an atheist just tries to pray they're going to see benefits from it uh showing gratitude for everything you have that day instead of being ungrateful and saying oh it could have been better i could have had more hedonism just being like grateful like maybe something bad happened, but there's always a way to view it that that it's for like an ultimate good. Like maybe you got a flat tire, but maybe you were going to get in a car crash and die that day. So through prayer, gratitude towards God, it's a focus on attention in this in this world where there's so many distractions and prayer. It's just it's just you. It's just you and God. You can focus your attention on what you really want to improve, what you're really grateful for. And you're aiming for something higher. And so key is like human, humans have always been idealists where we need a higher ideal to thrive for. And Christianity gives us that. Prayer gives us that. We're shooting for something. Um, I think I've seen Pew Research that says that, you know, most people believe that Christianity or religion leads to a more moral society. We can see the moral decay that we've seen in our in America in the past 60 years we could see that this has had really big effects where it's like now movies, TV shows, books, they all suck. A lot of people are sad and lonely. They're, they're, they, they, aren't even, um, they aren't even getting married. It's just people are, people are getting dumber too. They're just getting, you know, being a slave on their phone. Um, and so I would say to basically go back to your question is I, I believe in God because you know, Christianity, Christ has, you know, established his church. Um, I have done lots of prayers to God, and I have a, a relationship with God, and lots of people have a relationship uh, with God. And it, it, all these Messianic prophecies in the past showing that, you know, Jesus is God, and that I'm able to participate in this, that I'm able to do prayers to God, that I'm able to go to church and worship God, and feel the presence of God, where I'm able to uh, go and see miracles like the myrrh-bearing icons um, that we have in the Orthodox Church, and we're able to go to we have the uh, the sepulcher uh, where Jesus's tomb tomb is, and there's a miracle there every single year, the Holy Fire, where basically you know the the patriarch goes down there with nothing to light a torch, uh, the candle. And somehow it gets lit every year. And then when he comes out, he like he gives the fire to everyone else and the fire spreads and the fire doesn't hurt anyone. They can literally put it on their face and it doesn't catch fire, it doesn't hurt. So it's miracles like that, having a personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, you know, if you're an atheist, I would say try praying, go visit a church, literally have nothing to lose. It's like, if there is no God, then it, none, of, none of this matters. Who cares if you waste a Sunday? Who cares if, 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 if you waste time praying. It, it doesn't matter. But I think that's what God's looking for. It's just, you know, God has his hand. He's, he's knocking. It's just, are, are we listening? And uh, reading the Bible and lives of the saints, 
think that's something that distinguishes orthodoxy is seeing this living holiness in in the saints in the ancient times and medieval times and modern times is like orthodox i've met lots of people where i'm like i feel that person is holy and they're always super humble just experiencing god and, and christianity um that's 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 why i believe it and I believe i have logical reasons to justify it Orthodox Christianity seems to be gaining a great deal of popularity among youth in English-speaking countries. Why do you think this is, and do you fear that it could be a meme or a surface-level fad, or do you believe it signals a greater shift in Western religiosity? Yeah, so I don't think it's a surface-level fad, especially since in Orthodoxy, it's not like Islam, where you just take a shahada and now you're a Muslim, or a Protestant, you just go to the church and say, I've been saved. Orthodoxy is a process. You go to the, I, 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 I give people a link to go and find a local Orthodox church. They go there, they talk to a priest, then they in, they get enrolled in a catechism process. That process can be six months to four years. In the Didache, one of the oldest documents, it says that process should be three years. And so people who are actually inquiring into Orthodox Christianity, we're not just gonna baptize you that day. We need to make sure that you are committed to the faith. And that gets a lot of, like a lot of people that are just gonna do it as a fad, they're not gonna stick around for that long. But the people who are going to these classes and are, you know, continuing to learn more and more about their faith, they are going to find something so deep and so rich and an amazing uh, prayer life. And so when they get baptized, they're going to stay with it uh, for life. So I think that stops a lot of people from just like, oh, I'm Orthodox Christian. Now I'm something else. Now I'm something else. Now I'm something else because it requires commitment. And then I do believe it signals a greater shift in Western religiosity. <clears throat> I talked earlier about how in the West it's gone starting, you know, getting away from revelation to just theism and then deism and then eventually agnosticism and atheism. And I think that we see that in Protestantism and Catholicism is like it, it's been reflective in the worship too and also all the practices and schisms and everything happening within the Protestant world. And the Catholic Church just becoming more modernist, more liberal, especially with Vatican II and the Novus Ordo. I think this has caused them to die so much in the West. Is Western Christianity is dying because it's it's a pseudo spirituality. It's 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 missing the such important things about what it means to be a Christian. And so lots of people are leaving those and they're embracing you know, maybe Eastern religions, because people think it sounds cool and foreign. It's like, oh, Buddhism or Hinduism or just being spiritual because people do have an inherent need for spirituality. But uh, I think that is a surface level fad of people embracing like the Eastern religions and like atheist, you know, Sam Harris is okay with some like Buddhist practices and stuff like that. The other one that is growing is uh, Pentecostalism. It's like this hyper emotionalism, hyper spirituality where they're claiming to do all these miracles and, and things. You know, this has nothing in based in nothing in church history. Pentecostalism started in the 1900s. And I think what sets the tone for how to how to interpret this is uh, Father Seraphim Rose, who is basically very influential <coughs> convert to Orthodox Christianity in the 60s and 70s. He wrote about everything that we're seeing now in this book called Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. He wrote about how there's going to be you know, the pseudo spirituality of like Eastern religions, because he's what he was experiencing all of this. He studied under Alan Watts and Eastern religions. He was interested in all of that before it became uh, mainstream. He talks about a lot of the problems in Protestantism and Catholicism and these Eastern religions and these other phenomenons that we see with like you like UFOs and like people are now like that's almost turning into a new religion and new theology. People, you know, obsess about these show, shows and movies like Star Trek and all these things and they like really believe in aliens. Um, and also the like Pentecostalism and how it's kind of like pre or spiritual delusion. But he talks about it all of this about the greater shift in Western religiosity. So I think what we're going to see is that it's going to continue down this path where Protestantism and Catholicism are just going to kind of die away in the West. And Eastern Orthodoxy, if people are Christian, they're either going to be like, they're either going to come back to the, the truth and be rooted in, in, in the faith of the apostles, or they're going to embrace some pseudo-spirituality like Pentecostalism or Eastern religion, or just say, I'm spiritual. Um, but I think that we're seeing, and I've documented on my channel, if you search why Americans are becoming Orthodox, um, a lot of them, them are sharing all the reasons that I'm talking about. 
um, is that they, they want something deeper and serious, and they want true Christianity. I understand you used to be Catholic. Why did you switch to Orthodox? Yeah, I would say that I actually used to be Catholic, and I ended up in Orthodoxy because I took Catholicism very, very seriously. And I saw that the Catholic Church, starting with Vatican II, I saw contradictions in what the Catholic Church used to teach in the 19, uh, before the 1960s and after, and also changing how they worship God in the, in the Novus Ordo, New Ordo. And seeing all these radical changes where the Catholic Church contradicts all of their teachings, Going back to like the Council of Florence, that there's like no salvation outside the church. Basically, I saw the Catholic Church was contradicting all of those and that uh, Vatican I was a huge contradiction between uh, Vatican I was a council in the 1870s that made the Pope the highest position officially. And basically, it was like the highest papal language that uh, we, we ever saw uh, in the Catholic Church. And even now, they've been looking to undo it a little bit because it contradicts what the papacy was in the first thousand years. There was no Vatican I papacy in the, in the first thousand years. And I think great channels like Jay Dyer and Ubi Petrus really focus on this because they used to be Catholic, showing the contradictions in the Catholic Church. And also during the Great Schism, which I talked about earlier um, in 1054, the Catholic Church justified a lot of their claims using a lot of forgeries, like the <clears throat> Samantian forgeries, uh, pseudo Isidorian decrees, Libris Pontificalis, and a oh the donation of constantine so seeing all these errors in the catholic church starting now and then looking deeper and deeper and seeing that they've been innovating and that's what caused the great schism that's how i ended up in orthodoxy and since then you know any catholic watching there are huge differences that they should look into like these claims of papal supremacy that the catholic church claims where like the pope now picks every bishop in the entire world where the pope can be infallible and speak ex cathedra not found in the first thousand years. And they've admitted this in the Alexandria and Chady document. Uh, the Filioque, way, the Catholic Church added to the creed, this edition, they didn't add it with council. It was only added in 1014. Um, the popes actually were very against it. It was part of the geopolitical subversion of the church that Rome added this to, to the creed. And Rome also used to allow married priests. It wasn't until after the schism that they made their priests be celibate. Rome used to use leavened bread in the, in the Eucharist. Now they use unleavened bread and you don't even get the wine. You just get the unleavened wafer versus in orthodoxy, the Eucharist is in a chalice and you get the leavened bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, and then you receive it through a, a spoon. And it's very sad in the Catholic Church. A lot of people don't even believe in the real presence in the Eucharist because they just have lay people handing out the Eucharist just with their, with their hand versus in orthodoxy, uh, it's, it's done very, very reverently. And in the Latin Mass, they at least do it kneeling on the tongue, but still, unleavened bread and no wine is a change. And also, they deny infants communion. In the Catholic Church, you have lots of people that will get baptized as a kid, but they get confirmed when they're later. And so there's lots of people who aren't even confirmed Catholic, and they never receive the Eucharist because of this uh, over-scholasticism, over-rationality about the Eucharist. Versus in Orthodoxy, we baptize and chrismate our infants so they can receive communion. The Catholic Church also believes in purgatory, which there is not biblical evidence for the way that they describe it. And that's something that was added after the schism. They also have this doctrine of created grace that you're not even really, you're, you're, you're experiencing created effects of God and not the actual, not the actual uncreated energies. Um, and I think this, this really, uh, accelerates after the schism, <laughs> especially since Vatican II, they've been incredibly ecumenistic. I mean, they they act like we have like a false union between Orthodox and Catholic, and like even some some Protestants. They've canonized saints that used to be considered heretical, like this one saint, Saint Gregory of of Narik, who was an Armenian saint who who lived in the year a thousand. But the Armenian Church split from the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church in the four hundred. So this guy who died 600 years after the schism, Catholic Church, Pope Francis, <clears throat> canonized him a saint and as a doctor of the church, which in the Catholic system, they say no salvation outside the church in Council of Florinum and Unum Sanctum. But now they've canonized someone, a doctor of the church who's outside of the church. So this is a contradiction. In Vatican II, the documents on other religions, uh, Nostra Aetate, is so contrary to anything Catholic or Orthodox before. 
um, saying that Muslims believe in the same God, um, even talk, talking about you know Hindus in, in all of this. And we can see that you know popes like John, John Paul II embraced lots of false religions uh, in, in worship, in Assisi. And so it's just, there's a lot of contradictions with the modern Catholic Church. Where can people find you and where can they learn more about Orthodoxy? Yeah, so my channel is at Orthodox Kyle on YouTube. And you can subscribe to me and I have a playlist for whatever background you're coming from. I have a, a, a playlist on life advice, on Catholicism, Judaism, Islam, Protestantism, anything that people are considering. Um, I have a video on Eastern religions. So definitely go check those out. Go visit a local Orthodox church. If you're in America, just search up Orthodoxy in America and you can find a local church. Uh, definitely pray, trust Jesus Christ, and yeah, um, re reach out to me. I, I try to be very accessible on email and Instagram if anyone has any questions. Thank you for coming on and thank you for watching. Kyle will be linked in the description and you can watch more interviews like this by going to my channel. Please share with other people if you think they might enjoy it. Goodbye.